Well, good Sunday morning, First Baptist Church. As always, I appreciate all of you tuning in today, and I hope you're doing well in these days and you have been able to get out with all of this snow that we've had here recently. So today, I want to start with a scripture reading out of Colossians chapter 3, maybe a familiar one, but the first few verses. Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, how we give you praise today for the Lord Jesus Christ and how you have raised us up with him, how you have hidden our lives in him and secured us in him. And Father, today, as, as we gather together and sit before your word, we are seeking to understand and to set our mind on things that are above. And so we pray that you would give us wisdom and insight into your word today. Give us strength in putting it into practice. And Father, I do pray for your blessing upon all those tuning in today. Would you meet the various needs that are represented and in the congregation? And Father, we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Christina. So today, husbands, we are on the hot seat here. We're in the middle of this section, you might remember, where Peter is giving instructions to wives and husbands and how they relate to one another. We looked at the biblical instruction for wives last week, and in particular, we thought about wives married to unbelieving husbands. And you can go and check that out here on YouTube if you haven't seen that sermon yet. But today, we turn our attention to the husbands. And just by way of general observation here, before we get into the text itself, and I know this will sound kind of obvious, but it's worth emphasizing, we do have instruction here for both husband and wife, for both spouses here. And that's a good reminder for us that both the husband and the wife are actively involved in building a God-honoring and Christ-exalting marriage relationship. In other words, it's not all on the wife, and it's not all on the husband. Both have a part in building the marriage on a solid biblical foundation of God's Word. And today we're going to see instructions for husbands. So let's jump in here, 1 Peter chapter 3, and we're going to look at verse 7. You husbands, in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way as with someone weaker, since she is a woman, and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life, so that your prayers will not be hindered. Now before we get into the two main instructions here, notice, just like with the wives, Peter starts here with, in the same way. We asked the question last week, and we'll ask it again this morning, in the same way as what? Well, even though we're a little further down 
now here in this section, I would still tie this back into what we saw at the end of chapter 2. This example that Christ set for us of entrusting ourselves unto God who judges righteously. And so husbands, as we'll see here in a moment, we are to live with our wives in an understanding way and showing them honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life. This is what God has called us to do as husbands. And we put these instructions into practice, entrusting ourselves unto God, that his right plans and right purposes will be established and accomplished. This is important applicationally because, you know, sometimes in marriage, we will base putting biblical instruction into practice on, on what the other person is doing or whether we think they're doing their part or not. You know, as I've met with married couples over the years, quite often we will lay out, okay, here's all the biblical instruction for husbands, and here are the biblical instructions for wives, and here's the biblical description of a marriage relationship, and we lay all that out on the table and think about it, and it doesn't take too long for the husband to say, well, wait a minute, she's not doing this, this, and this, and for the wife to say to the husband, well, you're not doing this, this, and this, almost like we're going to base our obedience to the word on whether or not we think the other person is doing their part, whether or not your spouse is taking into account the biblical instruction given to them. It doesn't change one bit what you are called to do. And husbands, here's what we are called to do. Living with our wives in an understanding way and showing her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life. And we put these instructions into practice and trusting ourselves unto God who judges rightly. Let's start with this first instruction for husbands. Living with your wives in an understanding way as the weaker vessel since she's a woman. Literally, husbands, living with your wives according to knowledge. Several translations capture it this way. Living with your wives considerately or with consideration as the weaker vessel since she's a woman. Now before we get to the understanding way part, let's address this weaker vessel part. And this will actually help us husbands when we get to the understanding way. So in what way is the woman considered the weaker vessel? Well, let's cross some things off the list first. Peter's not saying that she's morally weaker. I mean, both husbands and wives struggle with the sinful nature. He's not saying that she's spiritually weaker. In fact, we're going to see she is a fellow heir, a co-heir of the grace of life. Peter's not saying that she's emotionally weaker. Although men and women do have different emotional needs and different emotional strengths and weaknesses, but he's not saying she's emotionally weaker. And Peter is not saying that the woman is somehow inferior as a person. You know that the man is up here and the woman is somehow lesser than. No. So what is he saying? Well, this term vessel, in the Jewish mindset, this term vessel often referred to the physical body. And that's how Peter's using the term here. He's simply pointing out here that, generally speaking, women are physically the weaker vessel and men are physically the stronger. Now, look, I know there is someone out there with an Aunt Helga who could whip six men in a bar fight. I get that. But we're not talking about the exception here. Peter's simply noting a general difference between men and women in physical strength. And by the way, Peter is not saying anything controversial here. He is saying something essential to the matter at hand, and the matter at hand is living with your wife in an understanding way, and this physical difference needs to be taken into account. But this was not controversial. This is just Peter reminding husbands, you take this difference into account as you relate to your wife and live with her in an understanding way. Now, I get it. It's controversial and offensive in our culture today to say that, generally speaking, men are physically stronger than women. But the reason that is offensive 
and controversial in our culture today, in large part is because as a culture and as a society, we have for so long exchanged the truth of God for lies. We have for so long worshipped and served the created rather than the creator. And in a sense, I think God has given us over to this bizarro world we have asked for, where everything is turned upside down and on its head, and we call truth lies and lies truth, and we call evil good and good evil and bitter sweet and sweet bitter. And in this upside down world, when it comes to gender, as we've seen recently, men can be considered women and women can be considered men. And now we've reached the absurd where you can't use the pronouns of he and she referring to men and women. You have to say they. You know, in this bizarro world, this is offensive and controversial. But in the world of biblical common sense, where God created male and female and they have obvious physical differences, and those differences are meant to complement one another, almost like God designed male and female to be together, this is not controversial. But it is essential to the matter at hand. And the matter at hand is how a husband lives with his wife. And particularly in this context, I mean, think of the broader context of the wife submitting to the husband. How does a husband live with his wife? He takes into account this physical difference. And he doesn't seek to exploit it, which is to say he doesn't relate to his wife and lead her in a domineering and demanding and heavy-handed kind of way. Rather, he lives with his wife he loves her and leads her with consideration in an understanding way, according to knowledge, which is Peter saying, I think at the core here of this instruction, husbands, you get to know your wife. What are her needs as best as you can understand them? What are her strengths and weaknesses? What are areas of struggle for her? What are things that she's going through right now and, and in the home and with the kids? And, you know, what experiences has she had that will shape the way she reacts in this circumstance or respond in this situation? Get to know your wife and live with her and love her and lead her according to knowledge. I was working on this sermon on Thursday there at the house. We were snowed in and we were all at home together. And Christina came into the office there where I was working. And I told her I was working on this section for husbands and living with your wife in an understanding way as the weaker vessel and, and working on what does this mean for husbands. And without missing a beat, she said, well, it means be nice to your wife and realize she doesn't always see things the same way that you do. Now, I thought two things. I thought, first of all, she came up with that answer pretty quickly, like she'd been thinking about this. But secondly, I thought, that's pretty good insight here. Husbands, as we are loving and leading in the marriage relationship, we may be prone to run roughshod, not just over her needs and feelings, but to run roughshod over her valuable and godly insight and wisdom in, in whatever particular area we're dealing with. You know, we just got the end goal in mind we want to get to, and here are the three steps we're going to take to get there. But living with her according to knowledge is we get to know our wives, not just her needs and strengths and weaknesses, but also valuing her wisdom and insight. And... I wouldn't limit knowledge here, this according to knowledge, to just getting to know your wife. Husbands, get to know the Word. Get to know the Word of God. Knowing the Word will help in your marriage by giving you godly wisdom. I mean, if we're going to lead, we need to lead with wisdom. And where are we going to get that wisdom? It's from the Scriptures. And God uses His Word in us to do a transformative work, shaping us more and more to be like Christ and to have that Christ-like character. And through the Spirit, applying the Word, 
bearing fruit like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, and so on. So live with your wives according to knowledge. Get to know her and get to know the word and love her and lead her accordingly. But here's what we're starting to see develop in the big picture. As we take into account what we saw last week for wives, we're starting to see a complementary relationship here that God has designed for the marriage relationship where the wife submits to her husband, yes, but the kind of loving leadership that the husband provides is not this domineering, heavy-handed kind of leadership, but one of living with his wife in an understanding way, getting to know her, taking into account her needs, her wisdom, her insight, etc., and loving and leading accordingly. And this would apply out whether or not the wife is a believer or an unbeliever. The instruction still applies. But I do think Peter has in mind here in this instruction that the wife is a believer. You could apply it out to, to non-believing wives as well, but I do think Peter has in mind that the wife is a believer because in this second instruction, as we move on in the verse, in the second main instruction for husbands, notice how does Peter describe the wife here? As a fellow heir of the grace of life. Here's the instruction, showing her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life. Husbands, when you look at your wife, when you look at your believing wife, what do you see? Peter says here, she is a co-heir, a fellow heir of the grace of life. You think in Peter's day and in Peter's context, in that first century Roman culture, wives would have generally been seen as below the husband and maybe one step ahead of the servants, but below the husband. But here, Peter is saying something revolutionary. Here you have this husband and wife. Christ has come into both of their lives and saved them, and now everything is being transformed in their lives and in their home and in their marriage relationship. The wife is not seen as lesser, but she is honored as a fellow heir of the grace of life. Husbands, think about this. You and your wife both share in the new life God, by His grace, has granted. You are both heirs and joint partakers of all the grace-filled promises of God. There's no lesser and greater here. There is husband and wife standing together on the ground of grace before the one true and living God, sharing in the same promises, both having new life in Christ. Husbands, honor her. Respect her. Treat her as a fellow heir. And as you think about applying this out, husbands, you know, how would you talk to your wife and treat her and respond to her and interact with her if you saw her as a fellow heir of the grace of life? What difference would it make in the marriage relationship if you saw both her and you standing together before God, joint heirs of the promises of God? The marriage is no adversarial relationship where one is trying to gain an advantage over the other and outmaneuver the other person, you are both co-heirs. And husbands, consider this. Consider just what a blessing God has granted in your life to have a believing wife so that you have in this life not just a physical partner but a spiritual one where you can travel this journey of faith together looking to God together, trusting in His promises together. Husbands, honor her as a fellow heir of the grace of life. And so, husbands, we get these two main instructions here. Living with your wives in an understanding way and showing her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life. Now, if you are not familiar with this verse... 
we get a surprise twist here at the end, at least for modern day readers. Because we might think, when it comes to marriage and thinking about the marriage relationship, well, of course, Peter must be telling husbands all of this and to do these things so that we can have a happy and perfect marriage and enjoy moonlit walks along the beach and live happily ever after. And yes, part of having a healthy and fulfilling marriage relationship is putting these biblical instructions into practice. But would you notice... The result Peter has in view here. Husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way and showing her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life so that, I mean, what's the result that Peter has in view? So that your prayers will not be hindered. If you're not familiar with that verse, you never see that coming. So that your prayers will not be hindered. So what does that mean? so that your prayers will not be caused to be hindered or impeded. What does that mean? Well, first of all, I wouldn't limit this to just the husband's prayers being hindered, even though this verse is to husbands. I think this applies to both the prayers of the husband and the wife, and even the husband and wife praying together. As co-heirs of the grace of life, I have this partner, and we share in this journey of faith together. And I'm praying for her, and she's praying for me, and we are praying together. And we're praying about what situations might come our way and what God is doing in our lives. We are being sober-minded and alert for the purpose of prayer, as Peter's going to say over in chapter 4 and verse 7. But here's the thing. If I am not living with my wife in an understanding way, and I'm not honoring her as a fellow heir of the grace of life, how that will cause a kind of roadblock in our praying for one another and with one another. It's harder to kneel down and pray for someone and with someone when there's harsh treatment in that relationship and when there's hardness of heart in that relationship and when there's strife and contention. It's not that it can't be done. It's not that you can't pray, but there's a hindrance there. You know, one of the greatest blessings in marriage is to have a praying spouse. To have someone who will pray for you. And you pray for them. And you both pray together. And you think in Peter's context here of these believers being persecuted for their faith and husband and wife walking together through fiery trials, as Peter will call them later. How prayer would have been a necessity for the husband and the wife. But it is no less so for us today, for husbands and wives, as we walk through the trials of life together, as we walk through this journey of faith together, and we pray, and we pray for each other and with one another, and we don't want to cause any kind of hindrances or roadblocks there in that prayer. So husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way showing them honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life so that your prayers, yours, hers, both of yours together, so that your prayers will not be hindered. Well, we're going to pause there, but speaking of prayer, how we as husbands need God's wisdom and strength and help in putting His Word into practice And so let's go before the Lord in prayer today. Father, how we do continue to pray for husbands and wives listening today, that you would bless and strengthen their marriage relationship. And Father, how a marriage is built on a solid foundation when it is built on your word. And so would you help us as husbands to put your word into practice today, trusting in you, and living with our wives in an understanding way, showing them honor as heirs of the grace of life. And Father, we thank you for the gift of marriage and the gift of our wife. And Father, we do ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.